Hello, everyone. My name is Robert, and I'm addicted to Pokemon Go. <laughs> but I can quit whenever I want to. And despite that, or maybe because of that, uh, I'm really happy to be invited to come here and speak at Mozilla's View Source conference. And especially doing it in Germany is just what I expected it to be. There's a lot of caps, there's a lot of Achtungs, there's alarms, exclamation points. So it's really living up to what I wanted it to be. And these screens, they are amazing. <laughs> Hello? Um, <laughs> what's what, what's your name? Hi, Wanda. Hi. Are you, are you having a good time? Well, <laughs> well, thank you very much, Wanda. Thank you for these two days. An applause for Wanda. <laughs> One thing that's very good to know is, is also, um, I'm coming from Sweden, uh, and I want to start by apologizing. Uh, we might have done a lot of harm in the world. So if you've gone through the pain, we're sorry. We're working on it. We're making it better. And another thing about Swedes as well is that we're very sort of shy on the outside. So we have a lot of feelings on the inside. Uh, but on the outside, it doesn't really come off like that. So I'm, I'm really on fire on the inside. But I, it might not really show here. It's just good to know. So my background, uh, I've been a web developer since 1999. Uh, and been involved in the Mozilla community from 2009. And the fun background there is my first international presentation I ever did was for Mozilla in Berlin in 2009. It, another venue, but, but still here. And it was an extension workshop. Uh, so it really kind of feels like full circle to, to get to come here and to speak to you today in the same city in, under the Mozilla umbrella. And Lena was talking this morning about heroes and, and like a hero community. If there's anything that I, that I believe you need to know is that all of you are the heroes. All of you in the community taking the time to help people, to share information. So a big hand for you. You are the heroes. We're not. But of course, everyone has a history. And uh, yeah, it's me, OK? Doesn't look like that. Um, and I'm not really sure what the background is, but the, the only thing that I'm sort of sure about when I see this picture is that I would probably directly qualify into a Russian dating site. <laughs> so it's always good. If I ever consider my options, that's one way to go. So currently, I work for Google and uh, working with web developer relations at Google for all of the web platform. Uh, and some of the areas that I spend the most time with, uh, naturally being happy to speak at conferences and travel around, but also working with developer feedback, how we can make sure that we make the web platform better, not only with, with Chrome, of course, but across the board. How can we make it easier for developers? And an interesting part here is also that I work from Sweden, from the Stockholm office. And I don't have any sort of direct colleagues there. They're all based in London or in Mountain View or, or Seattle. Um, so recently, we were sort of running out of space with new desks for people. So they moved me to a temp space. So now I'm sitting in my own corner on floor eight. And it's, it kind of gives you these office space wives here. Uh, actually, a funny side story here, and not entirely sure it's true, but when they made the Office Space movie, Swing Line, who were producing these staplers, they actually didn't have a red stapler like this. So the, the stapler was painted red in the movies. 
But then after the movie, it became such a success, so they have to start mass manufacturing them. So you need to sort of thank the movie for all the red staplers in your life. And I'm here to talk about the future of the web. And with that, of course, we need to talk about the web as today as well. So about six years ago, Wired had this article. And it was an editorial, and it's kind of tiring when you see these things. And it's always like the, the media thing of trying to pick a fight or killing off technologies or, or something like that. And then um, a few years later, this spring, they had another article that apparently the web is, isn't dead after all, new editor. And if you sort of look beyond the, the, the Chrome logo here, I think the web as a whole is really thriving and really having a, a comeback right now. Um, if you only look like from our side with Google, so Chrome on mobile alone, in November last year, it had 800 million users. In April this year, we reached 1 billion users. And that's only one browser and only on mobile. And you get in all the other browsers there as well. Uh, so there, it's an amazing reach, and it just keeps on growing. So it might not always get the media attention, the web might not be sexy all the time, but it is the thing that is both the past and the future. So the web isn't dead. The web is pretty far from dead, actually. And I think what it sort of came from was that for the last few years, especially sort of around 2010 when the first editorial came, was that the web experience on mobile was something like this. You would get in somewhere, you get a big pop-up, you get forced to install an app that you never wanted to install just to get something done. And I think that that is getting better. And, and also from like Google search results side, websites who have these pop-ups or interstitials that blocks the user experience right now would actually get penalized in search results. Uh, so if you're having pop-ups like that, please stop. And also, like Chris was talking about before today, uh, if you're looking at apps right now, uh, it's very few apps that people actually use all the time. Like it's Facebook, Twitter, some other stuff, Instagram. Um, and that's it. People don't keep on installing new apps because it's still the extra hurdle of finding something, maybe paying for it, installing it, using it once. I think of the apps that people install, they only use 50% of the apps one time, and that's it, and then they never use it again. And also, when, of course, when we talk about the web, and I just want to keep on stressing this, of course, we talk the web as all browser across the board. Everyone uh, everywhere should be able to be involved. It shouldn't just be one browser, because then we're committing the same mistake as we had many, many years ago, and we don't want that. So of course, with that said, I work at Google. Uh, so some of the things that I'll be covering today are things that we're working at, with in Chrome, um, but all of them are either APIs or features that we think should be out there across the web. So it's not something Google-specific in that sense. And also with the web apps today, most of the things that we spend time on uh, is progressive web apps. Uh, and progressive web apps is sort of like, you know, the new Ajax or the new HTML5 or something like that. It's sort of become this collective term of how can we make the web better? How can we make sure to cater to users' needs? And there are six quick things that I was going to reiterate, and, and Chris were talking about them before today. But one is having instant loading, uh, both for offline scenarios, but also poor network conditions. Just making sure that it, it's as instant of an experience for the user as possible. We're also talking about add to home screen. Uh, one is, of course, triggering the add to home screen thing within web pages, uh, with the install banners, and also that you have it in the menus. And then basically, what you need is just having the manifest file. Uh, for your website. And then having push notifications for re-engagement. Uh, and then a really important thing, and why I have it in here, is with notifications, they are great. We can see great numbers with how many people come back to websites or web apps, and they keep on buying more things or looking at more pages, et cetera. But be, be really gentle with it. It shouldn't be deaf by notifications. It should only be when it makes sense, uh, when they're relevant or timely, um, and they are in the right context. And it's also about speed, and, and not only loading pages, but once you're in the page, uh, that you want to have smooth animations, you want to have smooth scrolling, uh, and both navigation within the page and between different pages as well. And secure. Uh, HTTPS is basically just the way to go. It, it might be um, 
hard in the beginning. It might be a challenge, but it's, it's a lot easier now than it used to be. And also looking at a lot of the new APIs coming to the web, they will require HTTPS. And also last week, uh, we put a blog post out there that for regular HTTP pages, we'll start putting warnings in Chrome as well, uh, showing users that this is not secure. We can't guarantee uh, that everything that's being transmitted here is being secure. And, and the bottom one is one way how it might look in the future. So it actually doesn't look that good. So if you haven't gone into HTTPS yet, uh, now is a really, really good time to start. And the final part uh, is responsive. So whatever you build, make sure that it works on any kind of resolution and as, as many devices as possible. Just load the, the right resources. So reiterating what was said before, progressive web apps today are reliable, fast, engaging, and secure. And we've come a really long way in only the last few years with APIs and, and feature support. So the way I see it, the web is already almighty powerful. The web is amazing. And, and I think sometimes we're kind of missing that because we're living with it every day. At the same time, it's just the beginning. Uh, it's just kind of what's needed to play to match some of the native features that users have gotten used to expect. Uh, so all things like notifications at the home screen, offline, et cetera, those are the first things we need to do. They're the table stakes to be able to play on, on in the mobile area. Um, so what about the future? I think one thing when you go to conferences, um, you can hear about the future, you can hear visions, what it's going to be like in five years, et cetera. I, I have no clue what it's going to be like in five years. Um, and I'd rather have people going to conference hearing about the futures more of near term, uh, like what's happening right, right now or what's happening in the near future or within a year. So. All the things I'll be talking about today, they're not going to be things like robots being built out of old mobile phones or something like that. I won't be talking about flying cars. Uh, so more things that are tangible for you. So things like knowing who the user is, credentials management, and paying for things on the web, which is crucial. Connecting with hardware, something called the physical web, and I just briefly touch on web VR because Dominic was covering that. So starting with knowing who the user is right now, um, it's still really hard for users on the mobile web. Like if they come to a web page and they need to sign in somewhere, uh, you never sort of remember what kind of login you used. Do you use your Facebook account or your Google account? Usually you know the email you're using. Uh, usually you also have no idea which password you were using. And you try to figure out, did I actually ever sign up for this? Or I'm just trying again? And then you find the magical link, the forgot password link. Uh, is there anyone here who haven't clicked forgot password? Yeah, okay. So we have, <laughs> what? Out. <laughs> and also, typing on mobile devices is really, really hard. As soon as you want to log in, you keep on typing something, you get something wrong, and it's just, just annoying, right? Can you guess what this is? Yeah, so this was, this was the winner in 2015 of the most popular password. Uh, and after a few years, it actually pushed down the, the previous password, which was actually the word password. <laughs> so it's a, it's a tough game, right? That are just next to each other. Uh, and of course, this poses an enormous security risk, and especially with people reusing passwords across websites. Don't do that. I know you will, but don't. Uh, and one way we're trying to approach it uh, from within the browser side is um, building something called smart lock for passwords and just making sure that we're saving passwords and having them synced across devices. So only through smart lock from our side, we have 8 billion sign-ins every month that goes through smart lock. So it's sort of being taken care of for the user. And generally, that takes no effort from the web developers or a very little effort. But sometimes, when the web browser comes to a web page, it's not entirely sure which field will mean what. So there's something called the autocomplete attribute, where you can specify what the different things actually mean. So you can use, sorry, you can use name, telephone number, username, et cetera, to, to help them. 
And if you're having a sign in forum, for instance, you specify very clearly, like, this is the username, this is the current password. And why it says current password and not just password is because if you have a sign up form or, you know, forgot password form, uh, instead you have new password as the value. So basically, with new password, the browser won't try to autofill it with the password you saved before. It will actually expect a new password, which is great. But the other interesting part of this, like if you specify within your web page that you expect a new password from the users, and the users aren't really good at picking passwords, it means from the browser side that we can generate a much more secure password for the users. So instead of users having passwords like this, we can generate this. I mean, not exactly this all the time, because that would kind of kill the point. Uh, but a more unique and, and, and safe password for users. So we're experimenting within Chrome of auto-generating passwords. You have it in, in Canary and, and other versions, and we hope to make it deployed to stable soon. So basically, if you have forms in your web pages, use the autocomplete attributes. It's going to help all the browsers of saving information for your users. Which brings me to the Credentials Management API, uh, which is kind of the next generation for sign-in on the web. Uh, we just shipped this in, in Chrome. It's not in all browsers yet. It's definitely coming. And it allows you as a developer to integrate with the browser's credential manager. So if you look at AliExpress, for instance, uh, they have a nice flow where you go into the web page and then just have automatic sign-in. So once you're in there and you've been there before, you just get signed in. And since this is a shopping part, it's really important to have a streamlined experience. You don't want to sort of block the users with any kind of hurdle. And, and you've probably seen this research that for every step along the way, you lose 20% of your users. So making it as easy as possible to users is, of course, a good thing. And, and in this case, there's no sort of obvious place where you want to put it, because that would block the experience for the user. And code-wise, the way you do it, like on the navigator object, you have a credentials object. So basically, you call credentials.get uh, for getting the password. And one important part here is using unmediated, which means that there will be no prompt for the users. There won't be anything blocking the experience for them that they need to tap or fill in or something like that. It will just be done automatically for them. And with automatic sign-in, um, basically it's being offered if it's enabled, and if you have only one credential saved for that website. And again, coming back to HTTPS, um, it only works um, in a secure context, and naturally passwords aren't directly exposed to JavaScript. And within Fetch, it will only submit credentials to same site endpoint. And once you've gotten the credential from the user, you can just post them to the server uh, with Fetch uh, and just verify them and then sign the user in. So what if that's not an option, uh, if you want to have one tap sign in instead? And the experience is kind of similar. So you come in there, just choose the account you want to sign in with, and then you're in, right? So it's very similar, but just it needs that one tap to get in. And code-wise, it kind of looks the same. The only thing that's been removed here is the unmediated part. Otherwise, it's, it's just the same experience. And from a developer side, you also want to be more in control of storing the credentials for the user. So being in control when save the password is actually being triggered. So when you're filling things out, you can get a reference to your form, and then you call, call navigator.credentials and just store those credentials or storing that form for that user. And we also support federated logins. So if you log in with Facebook or Google Plus or something, uh, that's being supported as well. So and the way you do that, you just create a new federated credential object. So you have a username, and then you just specify which provider you're using for that login. So it's quite easy, actually. And finally, the last part, of course, is also logging users out. And the important thing with logging users out, of course, is making sure that they don't automatically get signed in over and over and over and get kind of in an endless loop. And a few companies started working with this, and, and some of these have it in production as well. Um, so I do recommend playing around with it and, and seeing kind of how it works with the automatic sign-in and, and those flows, like if it's a good experience for your users or if there's something missing. And once you sign in, um, we need to take care of this part which is paying for things on the web. And, and this is vital that we get it right. I think the big success behind the app stores and, and native apps, it's really, really easy to buy an app or in-app purchases or something like that. 
because you know you store your credit card once and then you just keep on buying Smurf berries or something like that. So on the web, of course, we need to meet that and, and hopefully surpass that as well. And even looking where we are right now and the rise of mobile computing and, and most of the traffic coming from uh, mobile devices, still 66% of the purchases on the mobile are on the web, not native apps, mobile web. So again, the web isn't really dead. 66% out of however many internet users is a good number. And looking at some recent data uh, throughout Europe, you can see that with France, Italy, Spain, it's sort of on that level. Uh, UK is a bit below, and then Germany as well. I don't know, Germany, make it better, please. But some other statistics as well is also seeing the different kind of actions that users are doing and, and what they're using for that. When are they using a native app? When are they using the, the mobile web? Uh, it's kind of small. I'll share the slides after so you can look at this as well. So that's all good and well. Uh, but if you compare mobile web to desktop web and, and paying for things, there are 66 fewer conversions on mobile websites versus desktop, which basically means you only have one third as many conversions on mobile web, which isn't great. It's still a crazy amount of people, but it isn't great. But it's, it's pretty simple reason, actually. And it sort of comes back to, again, form and, and typing on mobile devices. So have you ever abandoned a, a, a purchase because of the checkout form? So forms on the web today, and, and specifically on mobile, they're, they're manual and tedious and slow, and it, it takes a certain amount of tabs to get through it. And especially if you're trying to fill out a credit card number or something like that, and you don't even get the number keyboard on your phone, so you're getting the, like, the extra secondary keyboard thing to try to fill it out. Um, so again, sort of from the browser side, it's always a delicate balance what you can do within the browser to solve issues and what you can do with APIs or, or certain standards. But with this, we started working with autofill. Uh, so if you have something filled out that's been saved before, just autofill for the user directly. Like, it's usually like shipping addresses, sorry, addresses, credit card numbers, and, and stuff like that. And the way it works is that the credit card and address is being saved into Chrome, and then we have the automatic form detection, which is around 95% accuracy. Uh, and then it gets filled out automatically. And naturally, if you want, you can synchronize it between devices as well. And if you look at conversion rates, only with autofill, uh, we've seen a 25% increase in conversion, which is great. That's a lot of people. Uh, and only just the small, small tweaks, not sort of, oh, all this terrible, we need to build web 4.0 or something like that. Just, you know, we have a lot of good things. We just need to kind of tweak them and adapt them to the user's behaviors. So with autofill, we've sort of gone from manual and tedious to making things more automatic and simple for users. They're still kind of slow and they still take a certain amount of taps. Um, so we kind of were halfway there. So imagine a world without forms. It would be a beautiful world, and it would probably never happen, but it would be a beautiful world. But what if it actually happens? What if the new thing that's being worked on, um, payment request, We'll take care of that. So if you can go in somewhere, and there's not even a hint of a form, you can just use your stored payment options, pay for things, and you're done, which is amazing. Uh, so it's just a simple JavaScript API, uh, and then the complicated parts are being taken care of in the different browsers. And this is an openly developed uh, API. This is not a Chrome-specific thing. There are a number of different companies working on this. Um, so it's currently under development uh, in the W3C Web Payments Working Group. And naturally, of course, it needs to work cross-browser. This is not a one-browser thing. Um, and of course, you know, not only Chrome, and especially Microsoft have been really good in this area and, and helping out and, and building things and testing things. Our implementation has been on mobile first because we think it's much, much harder on mobile than on desktop. But then, of course, over time, you want to make sure that it's cross-platform. So you have it on mobile, you have it on desktop, you basically have it everywhere. And also that we get an open ecosystem so we can support any kind of payments out there. So if you're adding on payment requests, uh, we're making forms automatic and, and simple uh, and all kinds of payments, but also making them much faster. You can actually go to one-tap checkouts, which is fantastic, right? This is a revolution. 
Yes? Anyone? Yeah, I don't care. I'm going to buy a lot of shit with this. And code-wise, it's actually fairly simple. So if you want to implement this in a web page, um, it kind of looks like this. And the W3C it has a first public working draft, and this is the implementation that we have in Chrome right now. So it might change over time, but it's probably going to be very similar to, to this over time. And the way you do it, you have the first parameter. So you have an array, and you specify the different payment parameters, um, or sorry, the, the payment options. So you can have different credit cards in there, for instance. And then the browser uses the available methods that you have stored in the browser. Um, the default case is basically you only request um, a credit card. And the other things that you're seeing here are the line items, basically the things that you're buying. Uh, so the cost for each device. And then finally, you have a Boolean whether you want to request an extra cost for shipping or not. And the experience, user, uh, experience for users, then, is basically if you come in there and you have different payment options, for instance, you choose your payment option. You might get a question about the shipping. You choose what kind of shipping you want. You process the payment, and you're done. That's it. That's how easy it could be to buy things on the web. And even beyond credit card, I mean, from Google's side, last year we launched Android Pay, uh, which has seen a, a really good uptake. But of course, that's been within Android apps. And actually, we need it on the web as well. Uh, and, and the way we see Android Pay, like it's an even more secure, tokenized version of your card. And code-wise, it's just the same thing as before. Uh, so you have the different payment options. You just keep on adding other ones beyond credit cards. So you add Android Pay in there. And then in this case, Android Pay will require a few specific parameters. And that's the important thing. And because, I mean, Android Pay, we sort of know those people. So we work together and implement that. But it shouldn't, of course, be only Android Pay. It should be any kind of third-party payment provider that can offer this to users. And the API should stay the same. Even if different payment options might require different parameters or, or details or something, the core of it, the, the, the entire skeleton, should be the same. So when can you start using this? So we, we shipped it back in May behind a, a flag in Chrome. Uh, we're now having it in Chrome 53 on Android, and uh, we hope to be able to launch to stable Chrome later this year. And then in early 2017, we want to look sort of beyond mobile and, and get it onto more platforms, and of course, working with other browser vendors um, and seeing their implementations, and also having more third-party payment providers as well. And again, a few companies started working with this. Um, and bits and pieces are in production there as well. And I, I think payments on the web is crucial. Like, if we don't get payments right, it's going to be really, really bad. People go through the pain for a while, but eventually we will lose out on a lot. So please, please try it out. Give us feedback. Give the other vendors feedback. Give W3C feedback, because we need to get it right now for once. So we're talking about making it easier for users to log in, making it easier for them to, to pay for things. So I want to talk a bit about connecting to hardware. And the web has already sort of had access to hardware with accelerometers and game controllers and uh, camera, audio input, output, et cetera. So the thing I wanted to mention more specifically today is talking about web Bluetooth. Uh, and not necessarily headsets and, and trying to connect in meetings. Uh, but more like heart rate sensors and similar, like really small things that support Bluetooth that you can communicate with. And right now, Bluetooth is at version 4. Uh, and it's generally referred to as BLE, or Bluetooth Low Energy. And if you look at the evolution of transfer rates over time, with Wi-Fi, it's increased a lot. With Ethernet, it's increased a lot. With Bluetooth, in version 3, we have 54 megabits per second, Version 4 has 0 0.3. What the Firefox is going on there? But actually, it's pretty simple. Uh, it comes down to power and cost. Um, the power consumption in these devices, you want them to be able to live for as long as possible without needing any extra charging. And the other part is, of course, just the cost of producing devices. If we want a lot of devices out there, we want to make sure that people can, or companies can produce them so we have more of them so it doesn't just become a few of them. That's really expensive. 
And with Web Bluetooth, we've connect, connected remote controlled race cars, Bluetooth low energy printers, uh, Spheros BB 8 robot. If you haven't played with that, that's a lot of fun. Uh, but also things like Dotty, which is a Bluetooth LED notification display. So I, I thought I'd be brave and then try something here. So this is a Bluetooth candle. This is a phone. Candle, phone. What I'll do is that I'll go into a web page here, web page, and I'll tap connect. So it finds the candle here. So it gives me an option so I can choose the candle and then I can pair with it. And once I've paired with the candle, like normal web page, I can control the different effects on the candle, what I want it to show. Or, you know, if we should be pulsating or you have the, the rainbow effect. We've come a really long way as a species, haven't we? This is fantastic. And, you know, simply from what it, in a web page. It doesn't take much, it doesn't take much code, but it's really easy to, to connect. And since this is a candle, do you think I can blow it out? <laughs> Pretty cool, right? Yeah, amazing physical skills, like the shape I have to be in to blow out that candle. And this demo is available on GitHub. So if you want to try something out there uh, and just buy some kind of um, cheap Bluetooth device, it's, it's really easy to start experimenting. And looking at this demo, uh, you have a few things that you should know about. You have the central device, which is the phone. You have the peripheral device, which is the candle. And then you have something called GAT, which is a generic attribute profile. And basically, the central device, the phone, interacts with the GAT server of the peripheral device, the candle, and then it asks what kind of services it supports. So what you will get back for, from the candle, for instance, are the services and characteristics that you can interact with. And the code for that uh, is something called navigator.bluetooth to get a modal picker. And it's really important to know that this, calling Bluetooth.requestDevice, it, again, it needs to be within a secure context. So you need the HTTPS for this. But if you want to try something locally as well, you can run it on localhost and, and try things out. The other thing is that it needs to be called from a user interaction. You, see, you, you can't just automatically connect people to any Bluetooth device out there. It would be fun for a while, but you know. So it needs a user interaction, like a tap on a button or, or something similar. And also, when you want to connect here, and you see the request device method here, the options parameter here is mandatory. And it's basically just specify what kind of services you're looking for within Bluetooth devices near you. Because there's so much Bluetooth already out there, so instead of getting a list of hundreds and hundreds of devices, you want to ensure that I only want to connect to the ones where I can actually read or connect to the battery service here. And once you're connected to the device, you connect to the GET server of that device. And you're paired. And then you connect to the GET servers. You get the primary service, which is the battery service. And once you have that, you get the characteristic, which is the battery level. And then you use the read value method to get out any kind of value that you're looking for. Um, for instance here, just the level of the battery within something. And vice versa, you can write things to devices as well, like with this candle and changing the colors and that. You just connect to the candle, you call the primary service to get the candle service UUID, and then you connect to the characteristic, which is the candle color UUID, which is great. And then you just use um, uh, write value to change the color of the candle. And if you look at these values, um, like candle service, UUID, et cetera, they kind of seem magical. Like, how do I actually know the names of, of the parameters on the device? Um, so most Bluetooth devices um, come with a programming guide. Uh, but if you don't have that, one way you can do it, I know people are excited about this, me too. Uh, one way you can do this is that you can control, sorry, install control software on Android and then turn on the developer option in Android settings. And that way you can capture all the Bluetooth packets and just read out the log and, and seeing what the different things are being named when you communicate with it. 
And then finally, you can also have uh, event listeners. So you have a certain value, uh, in this case with the candle, and then you can see if that value is being changed. Um, so you have the characteristic value changed, and then you see, for instance, if the candle was being blown out, then you can act accordingly to that. I'll briefly also mention Web NFC. Uh, and basically just, it, it's one of the specs being written on right now, and basically using JSON to connect through over NFC with devices and communicate. Um, and a shout out to Kenneth. Um, he's one of the two people working on that spec. Uh, so you should definitely, you should follow him on Twitter, and you should see the progress, and you should ask him any questions. This is, by the way, the best picture I can find of him. So you can imagine the shit that I had to go through to get here. The web is a terrible place sometimes. We also have generic sensors, which is another spec that's being worked on, where you can have any kind of sensors on different kinds of devices. So if you want to connect to a car and then you want to see the, the tire pressure um, on the rear left side of a car, you could do that. And then you have different events, for instance, that changing and, and things like that. And same with geolocation. You can have a geolocation sensor with a number of different event handlers and then interact with that. So it's worth looking out and trying to get a more generic way from the web side of interacting with any kind of sensors out there. And talking about web Bluetooth, it kind of leads me into the physical web. And basically, the physical web is about beacons. They sort of look like this. And the only thing they do in their existence, um, kind of philosophical here, but the only thing they do in their existence is that they broadcast a URL. So they just send out a URL, and from the phone, uh, with web Bluetooth, you can just see what's happening with that URL. Um, and it's also being based on how close you are to something. So if you have it on a train station, this can broadcast a URL with a link just to the train schedule, for instance. Or if you're parking your car, you can stay in the car, just see the URL from a beacon, and then pay for your parking. Um, or you know, shopping malls, if you walk by a store and broadcast that it has a sale today with 30%, you know, come in, buy, buy, buy. Which is great. Uh, so lots of small, small things you can do with these. And in the future, we're also looking at something called a uh, referring device. So instead of with the physical web beacons, instead of just having the URL, which is a good start, um, it's also you can connect to the GAT server of that device. And then, as we saw before, same as with the candle, directly interface with beacons and other things like that with web Bluetooth as well. So right now, it's behind an experimental flag um, in Chrome, and you know, Chrome OS, Chrome Android, Chrome for Linux. We're also working on more stable versions in OS X and Windows, and Opera have also implemented this. And we've seen a really big interest around web Bluetooth. So we're hoping that more web browsers will get on board and start doing this as well. And it takes me on to web VR. And uh, Dominic was covering that just fine. Uh, so I'll, I'll briefly just mention a few things. And one interesting thing about version one of the web, 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 sorry, web VR API uh, is that it's landing in browsers. Like two, three weeks ago, it landed in Firefox Nightly. Uh, we're going to have it in Chrome later this year. And then just a few days ago, Microsoft also published a post that it began development on web VR, and also that all players are working together on specification, what it should look like, and to make sure that we get it right. And at our big developer conference at Google I.O. back in May, we announced something called Daydream. And basically, Daydream is two different things. One is just a spec for what's required of mobile devices to be able to offer a good VR experience. Because basically, if you're on a v in a VR world and you don't get the, the good frame rate or something like that, it's very, very easy to feel sick, which we don't want. Um, the other part is specifying what kind of experience the user should have. So the minimum requirements to become a daydream device or daydream experience is one, having enough good performance in the device. The other one is making sure that we have headsets um, with a strap. So with cardboard, for instance, the average user time is two minutes. Uh, so naturally, you need a strap to make sure that it lasts longer. The other part is that they have to be shipped with the remote control, uh, something like this. 
because we, when you're in the VR world, you don't want to touch the headset, or you don't want to have an Xbox controller, which would be like a spider in your hand. Like you want something that's really, really simple. So the specification here for the remote is basically you have the remote, you have one button to go home, one to select things, but you also have motion controllers in it, so you get a certain sense of freedom. And the top round part there is a touchpad, so you can move your finger around or you can use it as a gamepad or something like that if you want to. And then, of course, you just put your phone in and you have that experience. And this has been generally within more native experiments, uh, environments so far, uh, and a number of experiments. But of course, like everything else, we need to have this on the web. Uh, and also the way we can spread it and make it available to as many people as possible would be through the web. And it was mentioned before, but one really good way to get started is the, the work by the Mozilla VR team with A-Frame. Just wrapping 3GS and, and WebGL in HTML custom elements, and there you go. So if you want to fiddle around with it without you know, necessarily diving too deep into how it actually works, I really recommend that. We also have one thing called VR view for the web. So if you have a 360 photo or a 360 video or something like that, you can implement it directly within your web page. And the way it works, like if you're on a desktop computer, for instance, you get in there and you can click with the mouse and you can look around within the picture, which is nice. Uh, but if you have a, a VR headset of any kind, you can just put the phone in there and then you get the full immersive experience. And I think this is great. And I think one of the really strong areas of, of VR will have gaming and lots of interesting things there, but it will be still for a long time one niche part of it. I think it's more with this for getting people to experience places they might never ever be able to go to. Um, or if you're planning a trip somewhere, you want to look what the, that island or country or hotel or something like that is about. Uh, so it's a really, really nice day to get a more proper experience with places in the world. And an interesting part here as well is that um, the co-founder uh, and CEO of Oculus recently tweeted this as well. Which is great, because at, at the really high end, you have HTC Vives and you have Oculus Rift. And you have a few other players. Uh, but with him saying something like this, uh, the impl implications, sorry, implications, what will happen uh, with Oculus as well are great, right? So with all of this, um, what I want to stress is that any information that you have that can help us make the web better for you and easier for you to work with, let us know. Um, for the Chrome side, you can report bugs at crbug.com. Uh, we have chromestatus.com, just checking new platform features and, and status, and also direct links for reporting bugs. Our team is on Slack if you want to ask things or have a conversation. And we also try and post all of our videos on YouTube from talks and walkthroughs and, and things like that. And naturally, we're on Twitter as well. And what I want to end on is, for a long time, we sort of had the, the big five, the big five web browsers out there. And what I really think we need to get away from is sort of any kind of bickering between web browser vendors or, or fighting or, or taking sides. I think the really, really important things is join up and, and working together on that and making the web as a whole better. That's the only way to move forward. The threat is not really between web browsers, the threat is that the web will not be the first choice for developers and for users. And we need to really make sure of that, because the web is really, 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 really important. But also, seeing the, the progress only the last few years is that you know, only in the mobile world, we had the Android browsers for a while. Again, I'm sorry. Uh, but also, you know, Opera Mini, and then on the right-hand side, with Safari's Internet Browser, which is great and coming along great. We have UC Browser, for instance. So there's so many browsers out there. So you need to make sure that things work and all of those things. And we, from the browser vendor side, we're talking with all of these players. Uh, we're seeing any kind of way that we can work together and agree on things and, and try and build the same things. Uh, we shouldn't compete on the APIs within the web platform. I mean, if we need to compete, it could be speed or some web browser features, but the web platform as a whole needs to be the same, and we need to agree and work together on that. The, the web is kind of a freak show, but it's a beautiful mix of so many different things. 
So we don't want to miss out on that. This is a gang I would like to be part of, by the way. So what is the future of the web? I, to me, the future of the web is making things easier for users. Um, you know, filling out forms, paying for things, not having unsecured passwords, et cetera, but also bringing richer experiences, connecting to devices out there, having web VR and other things. There's so many things that we can do. The web is amazing, so let's not mess this up. Thank you.